This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Fridays last year on the show were fantastic. Talking some player props with JJ Zach Reese, and it was so much fun. We decided to run it back once again this year. JJ will be with us every single Friday talking about his favorite player props over at FanDuel Sportsbook and for the rest of this baseball season. Also, going to have pitching ninja Rob Friedman on to break down his favorite strikeout props across Major League Baseball. JJ Zach Reese, Rob Friedman, what more could you possibly want? Let's dive on in and get you ready for this week one NFL. Fell asleep. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned, to begin things by JJ Zacharias and check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. You can find his work at LateRound.com and on the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. JJ, we got one game in the books for week one. It feels so good. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. You know, David Montgomery was someone that I targeted a lot in my fantasy drafts this year. So it's good to see him find the end zone. Hopefully we get a little bit more Jameer Gibb usage, uh, you know, down the stretch here and, and throughout the rest of the season. And then looking at that Chiefs wide receiver group, Wolf. I mean, that was yeah. one of the worst just group performances I think that I've ever seen in, in football. Kadarius Tony, awful, awful game. Sky Moore was invisible for most of the game. I mean, it was just a, a really rough performance from that group. Like there was a team last night that ran out outside of Amon Ross St. Brown, Josh Reynolds, Khalif Raymond, and Marvin Jones, and they were the best receiving group on the field last night. How sad yeah. is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, if there's one game that you can point to to say wide receiver matters, and this yeah. is why these guys are getting paid the way they are getting paid, that's the game. Because even yeah. on the Detroit side, Marvin Jones had one of the worst games that I've ever seen him play. <laughs> Uh, probably his worst NFL game ever. Right. Right. <clears throat> so uh, it was just, it was just bad across the board. Thank God for the sun God. Right. Right. I exactly. Say, I say thank the sun God because exactly, you know, he had a, he had a great outing. I uh, needed him for DFS. So uh, we give all thanks and all praise to Amon Ross St. Brown. As always, we're going to dive in and talk some player props with JJ Ford today. Talk about his process and then talk about props he likes at FanDuel Sportsbook for this week. And then, as I mentioned later on today, Rob Freeman, pitching ninja, will swing by, talk about some strikeout props for Friday night. And then I'll close things out by talking some NASCAR, too. That's not worth the headline, but we'll talk about that uh, later on as well, because I still got to indulge myself even as we get into NFL season. Let's begin things, though, by talking about some player props. And I want to start things off here, JJ, by talking about something we referenced a couple weeks ago when we had you on the podcast, talking about projection building process. That was for the full season, talking about player props for a full year. But now, pretty much every time we talk props, we're talking for a single game. So how much does that process for you switch when you're looking at a single game versus a full season? Yeah, look, o over a season, I'm looking at things like win totals and and seeing how game scripts sort of might unfold across a 17-game campaign, right, for these teams. And so that's going to lead to these pass rate projections um, that are going to be static, if you will, uh, across the entire season. But on a weekly basis, that game script can wildly fluctuate from one game to another. You know, if there's a, a team that's, you know, maybe it's based on opponent, maybe a team's facing a really, really good opponent that they're not typically facing and that means a more pass heavy script for them because they're going to be trailing maybe it's because of injury right maybe the opposing team that they're facing uh has a quarterback injury or something and then it's going to be a run heavy script so um it's really you know looking at uh weekly numbers uh they're just naturally going to be a little bit more accurate than than season long numbers um because you're looking at things on a on an individual matchup and game basis um and so the you know the other thing too is that you can be flexible with injuries and things that are changing within a team. Whereas from a season long perspective, you're locked in, it's done. You know, you can't do anything about it at this point. So um, that, that's, that, those are the main differences you know, I think weekly projections, you should just be naturally more accurate. Right. Exactly. You're not guessing as much on health and stuff like that. Um, like injuries can happen during games, which is why unders are often viable. When we're talking about some props and stuff like that, you have to account for the possibility of that, but it's not, a 20% chance this running back gets hurt. It's more like, you know, whatever the single game odds for, uh, you know, running back getting hurt and stuff like that may be. Now, when we had you on the show here last year, JJ, we talked about situations that stood out to you. Some spots where maybe there was from some fluidity because 
in fluid situations, we're going to have guests, you know, we're going to have questions, but so do bookmakers. And that can be a good situation to find some value. So which fluid situations are you most interested in for this week and week one? Yeah, you know, I, I think that there are two wide receiver situations that are pretty interesting. One of them obviously being with the Rams without Cooper Cup. Right. Um, you know, when you think about projections and sort of how things work off of each other, you know, I know that this is a really, really big thing with like NBA DFS and and being able to just quickly react to players right. being inactive at the very last second. Not that I'm an NBA guy. This is this is <laughs> really, uh, talking at a very high level. But with the NFL and with football, um, you know, projections are not going to be as like precise as they would be necessarily with the NBA. But uh, you have to think about how a player being out then affects other players on that team and what it means for playing time. And so with the Rams in particular, you have Cooper Cup, and then you look at the rest of those wide receivers on that team, and there's really three other wide receivers outside of Cup that are relatively interesting, I guess you would say, uh, and that's Van Jefferson, Puka Nakua, and Tutu Atwell. Um, you know, you have Tyler Higby at tight end, and that's, that's a whole different story. But what I'm saying is with, with these wide receivers is that, you know, when you're in 11 personnel, which is a pretty common package that we see teams run, and, and you get these three wide sets – that means that this the 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 fourth wide receiver on the Rams who might be Puka Nakua might be Tutu Atwell. We don't really know. It's probably going to be Nakua, but the fourth wide receiver on that team uh, all of a sudden then becomes the third wide receiver on that team. And when he's the third wide receiver on that team, he's going to be on the field a lot more in those eleven personnel sets. So it's important to understand how that sort of shifts and moves. And so I think with this Rams team, you know, you have a negative game script this week against uh, a potential negative game script against Seattle. Uh, they probably will throw a lot of 11 personnel out there. We know that Sean McVay likes that, that, that package and he likes to run that way. You know, maybe they surprise us. And they run more 12 and, and two tight end sets just because of the Cooper cup injury. But regardless, it just means that we're going to see more Tutu two out well and Puka Nakua, you know, Van Jefferson was going to be on the field a lot regardless. Now his target share is going to get better, right? Uh, because Cooper cup is not in the picture and Van Jefferson's talent versus the rest of the talent on that team is greater, therefore his target share will increase more than likely, at least from a projection standpoint. But what's really, really important is that when these guys are sidelined, you know, these lower on the on the depth chart wide receivers and players get more opportunity to just be on the field. And so there's more opportunity for them to hit their over. And and I, I really, you know, the other situation that I wanted to get to, uh, which we could see, we might not see, it's not confirmed right now. It's Green Bay. Green Bay has two uh, wide receiver injuries right now with Romeo Dobbs, who got some practice in yesterday, but Christian Watson out of nowhere, um, you know, he's got an issue. And so if, if one of them are out, if both of them are out, that's going to elevate a player like Jaden Reed, who in 11 personnel and three wide sets, at least in week one, you know, hopefully he's able to build off of a, a good start to the season and then maybe become the wide receiver two or even wide receiver one on that team, who knows, but at least in week one, from the perspective of week one, if Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs are both healthy, that means Jaden Reed's only going to be on the field in three wide receiver sets for the most part, right? He's going to be their slot guy. And so if one of those guys are out, then all of a sudden he's in every down, every snap player. And that's a huge, huge deal from a projection standpoint, from him seeing a lot more production, and then you hypothetically going over. So if you see one of those guys confirmed out, then that means Jaden Reed's a more attractive option. And I think the encouraging thing for Jaden Reed and for Luke Musgrave as well is that even when they had Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs healthy during the preseason, they're playing a lot of snaps yep. with the first team offense. So I think that it's not a total projection to say, oh, well, their snaps will go up like they're going to play. And I think that that's encouraging with them because it's not total guesswork. We've already seen them on the field a lot. And yep. I could use that for Luke Musgrave, I assume, on Sunday in DFS. All right, let's talk about some yardage props, JJ. When you look at the board over at FanDuel Sportsbook, which yardage props are most enticing to you? Yeah, so the, one of the ones that really st stood out this week was Khalil Herbert. He, his his uh, rushing yards line was 49 and a half. Uh, I didn't check this morning, so maybe it changed, but 49 and a half. Um, I think the over is a, is a pretty good bet for, for Herbert. He's likely to start the season in that backfield as the 1A uh, in that Bears offense. You know, I think a player like Roshan Johnson could end up getting more involved as the season goes on. But here in week one, you know, they're likely going to lean on a guy who has some NFL experience more than, than the rookie, right? They do have Deontay Foreman there, but Herbert was the clear starter in the, in the preseason. To me, the bigger questions for Khalil Herbert as a player are in the receiving game and as a pass blocker. You know, they've openly talked about him not being that effective as a flat pass blocker, which is partially why or, or largely why they went out and got Roshan Johnson 
who's probably the best pass blocker from this year's draft class. And so, you know, you could see a decent game script against Green Bay, you know, especially with these wide receiver injuries. Um, but even regardless of all of that, here, here's the, the bottom line statistic. Khalil Herbert has seen double digit rushes in 10 career games. He's hit the over in every single one of those games. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident. He's an incredibly efficient runner. Very, very good on the ground. I feel good that he can get to this number. And again, it's another spot where the snaps during the preseason align with what you're saying, where he was on the field with the first team offense a lot during the preseason. That does matter. Any of the yarders props you like for this week, AJ? Yeah. So I also have uh, James Connor under 59 and a half rushing yards. Um, I'm very worried about uh, this Cardinals offense in general with Josh. Why would Dobbs. that be? Just curious. Yeah, uh, yeah, what right. would lead you be, to be worried there? <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, the coaching issues uh, could be there. I mean, we, we've all seen the clips of Jonathan Gannon uh, hyping up his team and talking to Rondell. I think we all knew that something was up when he had that Rondell Moore conversation earlier this offseason. But regardless of all that, regardless of all the, the speculation, um, you know, Washington is one of the best front sevens in football. Uh, there's not that much of a threat of a passer in this game with Josh Dobbs likely starting. And so... Why would they not sell to stop a guy like James Conner in this game? Um, and it's not like, you know, if you look at what happened last year with Conner, Conner didn't get to this number in seven of 13 games last year. And so you then layer on top the fact that some of those games were with Kyler Murray with a better offense. Right. Uh, now he gets this backup quarterback, which, you know, Dobbs is like a third stringer on most teams, if that. Uh, and then they're facing a good front in what's probably going to be a negative game script. They're seven point underdogs. I just have a hard time seeing Connor get to this number. I think it should be honestly like nine and a half or 10 yards lower than it currently is. I could not agree more. I don't understand why that number is so high given the team, given the potential game script and stuff like that. I think that one makes a lot of sense. What about touchdown props? What you see in there for this week? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Uh, one is Jahan Dotson. Now you have to shop a little bit for this one because Jahan Dotson, a FanDuel sports book, uh, his, his uh, anytime touchdown uh, is, is relatively fair. But over on DraftKings, you can get this at plus 235 as an anytime touchdown. You have Terry McLaurin. He's banged up. But even if Terry McLaurin goes, Jahan Dotson's projected to see about a 20% target share, uh, if not more, in this offense. Because McLaurin might not even be 100% if he does go. Uh, Arizona secondary, not very strong, especially at cornerback. Uh, obviously, that's what Jahan Dotson's going to take advantage of. Now, Dotson really outperformed in the touchdown column last year, which could be partially why Maybe the number looks the way that it does. Cause I, you know, again, if you look at other books, it's like plus 180 and yeah. this is plus 235. So there's a significant difference at, at DK in particular. Um, and, and maybe they're saying, you know, they're seeing that regression is going to hit because Dotson did score basically like three or four more touchdowns than he should have based on his usage and based on where he was seeing his targets. But man, the matchups there, Jahan Dotson is a very, very good football player. Uh, I have a, you know, the, the it's just, it just seems like a very easy go-to bet at plus 235. And also, like, Sam Howell's, like, style at UNC was, like, deep balls. Like, uh, not from, like, a, a rate perspective, but, like, it was – he liked go balls, and that seems to mesh well with Jahan Dotson and his kind of style of play. And last year, after um, he came back from injury and became a full-time starter once again, his target share was right in line with McLaurin's down that stretch run. Yeah. So, yeah. although I think a lot of the touchdown regression stuff comes from what he did earlier on – he actually earned a legit role later in the year. Yeah, and his, his yards per route run number was pretty weak to start the season during the front half of the season. That's a predictive metric that we always want to look at. Yeah. And the second half of the season, it's sort of like what we saw with George Pickens. The second half of the season, things got a lot, a lot better. It's almost like he was a rookie wide receiver. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty into Dotson, uh, you know, at that number. Okay, that is 175 at FanDuel Sportsbook, but as always, make sure you're shopping around for the best number on the Jahan Dotson anytime touchdown. Any other touchdown props this week, JJ? Yeah, I got one more. You know that with, with these anytime touchdowns, I like to get a little weird sure. uh, you know, with it. I'm going to say, you know, this is more of a long shot. It's plus 300 on FanDuel Sportsbook. I'm going to say Tank Bigsby as okay. an anytime touchdown. Uh, there's a chance, there's an outside chance that we see Bigsby as the Jags goal line guy. Last year, ETN converted just three of 13 goal line rushes. Now I know that Bigsby had that fumble in the preseason and that maybe that changes things and they uh, don't feel as confident. Uh, but Bigsby is a very physical runner, more physical than uh, Travis Etienne. Bigsby looked really good in my prospect model too. Uh, I think he's just a good running back, but there's also a chance that in this game, Jacksonville just gets ahead, um, you know, against a rookie quarterback uh, in Anthony Richardson. They don't have Jonathan Taylor. It could just get weird. It could just be uh, a rough situation. So, 
Uh, I'm looking at Tank Bigsby, seeing a positive game script. Maybe he's the goal line guy too, but maybe he gets some run in the second half and that could really lead to uh, you know him scoring a touchdown. And I think a lot of that was that was a lot of the reason why they took Tank Bigsby was ETN's. He got a lot of work inside the five, but was not productive on it. I think they wanted more of a banger kind of a guy to get the job done there. All right, JJ, any other props that stand out to you across week number one in the NFL? Yeah, I'm going to go to uh, the game in Seattle or with Seattle and, and L.A. Uh, and in that game, I have a same game parlay for you. This is a oh. plus 527 if you put it together. Cam Akers under 62 and a half yards on the ground. Uh, I think that could happen if the script goes in uh, Seattle's favor, which I think we're all sort of projecting that to happen. Uh, and then Kyron Williams has gotten a little bit of buzz out of out of camp and such. Um, you know, this this offseason is, is sort of splitting a backfield, potentially splitting a backfield with Akers, but at least being the pass catcher in that backfield. And so he might be on the field more if that negative game script hits. And then I'm just going to go straight to DK Metcalf on the other side. I'm going to hit the over on 60 and a half receiving yards. I know JS and Jackson Smith and Jigba. Uh, it so- sounds like he's going to go, but I don't know if he's going to be seeing the, the full number of snaps that he would see, you know, maybe in week five, week six with that, with that wrist. Um, the Rams secondary is horrific. So I think the DK Metcalf can take advantage of that. And then I also have him as an anytime touchdown scorer because yeah, I mean, you know, if he's going to, if he's going to gobble up a lot of yards, might as well go with the touchdown regression uh, the favorable regression with DK Metcalf and say he's going to find the end zone in week one after not finding the end, finding the end zone nearly enough in 2022. Uh, that is currently plus 531 for the Cam there Akers under 62 and a half rushing yards, DK Metcalf over 60 and a half receiving yards, and the DK Metcalf any time touchdown. And I think the key thing, JJ, with same game parlays is always you want these things to mesh well together. And obviously, like Metcalf over and Akers under may not because it's like, uh, you know, it implies Seahawks are passing and the right. Rams are also passing, but a DK Metcalf touchdown implies the Seahawks are scoring points. And that increases the odds the Rams are playing from behind, which means you're getting better odds than Akers. And you also have the other out, like you mentioned, if Kyron Williams gets more work, that could also be a route and under. Their their rushing offense was hideously inefficient last year too. So that's an, a route to an under there as well. So I think that one does make a lot of sense. From like a process perspective, making sure that those bets like make sense together. And I think that you definitely hit the nail on the head with that one. That is JJ Zacharyson. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at late round QB JJ, a lot of stuff for you in season. Uh, what can people find if they go to late round.com if they're trying to find your work entering week number one? Yeah. So right now, you know, draft season's over for fantasy football. So the draft guide doesn't really matter uh, for, for folks. I mean, it still might be interesting uh, for, for some people to, to manage their roster in season, but I got a Patreon and in that Patreon, I have weekly rankings, rest of season rankings, live Q and A's. We have a great discord community. You can check it all out over on late round.com. All righty. And check out JJ's podcast as well. The right late round fantasy football podcast, JJ, good luck to you in week one. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks buddy. All righty. That is JJ Zachary. And again, you can find him on Twitter at late round QB. If you want the Patreon go to late round.com for that. As mentioned though, the fun does not stop there because it is Friday and it's still baseball season, man. We can't give up on our K props just yet, which means we still got Rob Freeman coming on the show every Friday. And he is here with us right now. You can find Rob on Twitter at pitching Ninja. You can find him at Peacock MLB MLB on Fox and FanDuel Sportsbook. Rob, it is a true delight to have you get added into this Friday show as well. How you doing today? I'm doing great. I missed the intro music though. I know. I didn't even think about that. So you miss the intro <laughs> music and I have a segment after you, which means you don't hear the outro music either. So like you're kind of in an island here and I feel like you got the raw, raw end of the stick. I kind of feel like it too, but let's, let's brighten up everybody's day with some awesome baseball. Absolutely. And that's why we need to have you on this show still every Friday, despite it being NFL season is because it's Friday. There are jam packed slates pretty much every single Friday and a lot of good value in strikeout props because a lot of times the strikeout props, Rob, the issue can be is that they're picked over. You know, we got a lot of smart people who are betting into strikeout prop markets and they make those lines efficient. Maybe they're distracted. Maybe I'm distracted right now. So like, you got a, a couple fewer eyes, and that can be a good opportunity to potentially find some value in the strikeout prop markets. When you look at the Friday slate, Rob, any props standing out to you right now? You know, I think there were there were a number I was <clears throat> a number I was close on. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up with Ari Perez, who's one of my favorites. Like I always go with him, like I just do for for six Ks or more. 
Um, Bradish for six K is more and then Senga for seven or more, just because it's Kodai Senga and he's you know, he's on fire and pitching against a very strikeoutable lineup. Now we were talking about Perez, I think it was either last week or a couple of weeks ago, and wasn't his best night, but I think that it's important to keep in mind the context around that start because it was his second consecutive start against a Nationals team that is a very low strikeout team. And you talked about how Scherzer, you know, in a repeat matchup is one thing because he's a veteran, but like Perez is 20. And so like having him face the same lineup, that's that's a tough situation to be in. The Phillies are a good team, but they're not a low strikeout team. So right. I feel like for Perez tonight, it's probably a better spot for strikeouts, even though it's a tougher matchup, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, as well as, uh, I don't know what my voice is doing today, but <laughs> as, as well as with Sandy, Sandy's injury, I think they'll try to yeah. get a little more out of him. Um, the bullpen was used a lot yesterday, so I'm just thinking maybe give him a few more pitches. It always comes down to pitches with him. And the and it is important to consider those factors. You know, is the bullpen fresh? And in this situation, the answer is no. Um, the bullpen has had some blips at times as well. So maybe they are wanting to use their really talented young guy as we get down to the stretch of the season. So Perez, over five and a half, minus 140, the first leg for Rob. Let's go back uh, to Kyle Bradish, which is one of the ones you had mentioned as well. Taking on the Boston Red Sox. And Boston's a tough team to face because they've got a lot of veterans in that lineup who can kind of make your life difficult. But Bradish's number, I think, is pretty fair. Over five and a half is plus 102. What led you to be on Bradish for tonight? Just he's on a streak of pitching really well. I think five of his last six games, he's had six Ks or more. Um, Boston generally is a tough lineup. I think they've been a little easier lately, and I think yeah. Bradish is pitching particularly well. So that's that's the reason why I'm leaning that. When you've been watching Bradish, has there been a change that you've noticed that has led to this this uptick in, I would say, consistency as being a thing as well? Has there is something you've noticed there or no? I think his breaking stuff has been consistently really good yeah. um, recently. I think he just had to find his release point and be consistent with it. And that's what I'm seeing now is he he looks really good. Okay, so Bradish over five and a half is plus 102 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And of course, we're going with, uh, we're playing the hits, Rob. We're going with all the, <laughs> the key guys. I feel like it too, I know. And like, honestly, like, Senga is like a guy who earns that though. And Why am I going to pick against him, right? Right, it's like, it's Senga, but it's also Senga against a team that I feel like has been a fixture in this, this, uh, this discussion throughout this year in the Twins because they just love to strike out. And like they're still good offense, you know, full full respect to them for being good offense, but like they strike out so much. And Senga, six and a half strikeouts, minus 156. And again, we talked about this last week, Rob, but he seems like a competitor who, even when there's not a lot on the line, he seems like he wants that ball, seems like he's gonna go deep in games, and that's what you need to justify it over on a number this big. Yeah, the only thing I'm thinking is it's some kind of trap or something because <laughs> like like to me, this is a game where Senga should excel. He's been really good. I think he's trying to, you know, in his mind, he's a competitor and also wants to show that he's the ace of yeah. this, you know, and, and and this is another chance to put that stamp on it for next year. And I don't think it's a meaningless game for him. So yeah. I, I, I anticipate him putting up a lot of strikeouts in this game. You know, I, I think the number's low. Yes, yeah. I'm going there. I agree. I think the Senga's a uh, delightful guy to watch. Uh, so those numbers for Rob Perez over five and a half minus one forty. Kyle Bradish over five and a half at plus one to two, and then Senga over six and a half minus one fifty six. Now I think that Senga could be an option. We're talking about uh, the daily strikeout leaderboard. It is actually up uh, right now. Oh, there we go. Book, and Senga is the favorite. He is four to one. You say Kikuchi, who has been phenomenal from basically middle of May, early June on. Uh, he's been a delight to watch, but there's also Blake Snell. So it's a good leaderboard for tonight, Rob. Any value for you when you're looking at this board right now? Yeah, I'm surprised that Taj Bradley's so low. Like, yeah. I may take a look at him. I think he's got a you know a matchup against a very strikeoutable lineup. And, uh, and he's capable of putting up a lot of Ks. So that number's pretty good for him. I mean, I don't, it seems like it's some value there to me. Yeah, Taj Bradley, 17 to 1 to lead the night in strikeouts. And it is a loaded slate. Like there are a lot of guys who can rack up a lot of strikeouts, but he can too. And like you said, good matchup for him. So I don't think that's totally out of play for for Bradley tonight. I think that's a very fair number. Yeah, I, I would think so. I think um, you know, I, normally I'd be on Snell's side. It's a tough sure. 
tough lineup he's facing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I to me, Seng is a natural favorite. I looked at it, I'm like, all right, Seng has got to be the favorite. I would thought I thought Taj would be a little bit, I thought there'd be a little bit more money on him too. Yeah. If you can't quite get to the the Taj Bradley to like to lead the night in strikeouts prop, he is uh over six and a half is plus one twenty-four for him. I don't think that's a bad number either, given the Mariners are another team that will strike out plenty. Yep, I think that's it. And if you you know, with him, it's a little random being a rookie. Yeah, but he's got the stuff, and he's had those games where he just you know racks up a ton of strikeouts. I don't see why he can't do it against right. you know against the Mariners lineup. Okay, so check out the daily strikeout leaderboard over at FanDuel Sportsbook to see who stands out to you. Rob is in on Taj Bradley, 17 to 1, but a lot of good value potentially on the board over there for right now. That is Rob Freeman. Make sure you check him out on Twitter again at Pitching Ninja. Find his work on Peacock, MLB, MLB on Fox, and of course on FanDuel Sportsbook as well. And Rob, I'll find a way to make sure we can get the intro music for you at some point. I don't know if I had to like, you know, ship it to you, whatever, like, uh, like a CD. We'll go old school, ship it to you via CD. We'll find a way. I, I'm going to just use it as my ringtone. So all <laughs> anyone has to just call me, that'd be fine. You're going to like answer the phone. Like, this is my issue is when I hear the song, I talk really fast, but I talk fast in general. But like, and you're going to like pick up the phone and like be talking like a thousand miles per minute. Like, that's the way it's going to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I was expecting instead of coffee and stuff. So now I, <laughs> I got to go drink some coffee. Well, Rob, I appreciate it regardless. Thank you so much for coming on once again for today. I'm looking forward to you uh, to talking to you again once again next week as these playoff races continue to heat up. Let's go. All righty. Check out Rob Freeman on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find him again here at FanDuel Sportsbook, uh, doing a lot of fun streams and stuff, whether it be for Peacock or for us here at FanDuel. So uh, delight to have him on the show once again every Friday. We're going to talk about some NASCAR bets I like for Kansas to close out the week here in just one second. But first, the NFL is back, and the best place to celebrate is on FanDuel because right now all customers get a no-sweat bet for week one. Just place a bet on any week one NFL game. You'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. Bet on spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit the FanDuel Sportsbook app and kick off the NFL season with America's number one sportsbook. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. Refund issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max refund $5 unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-789. 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9 with it in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call one one eight seven seven eight hope and Y or text hope and Y in New York. Let's finish up here by talking about some NASCAR in Kansas. The second round of the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs is this weekend, and it's a pretty interesting race because we have not seen a track, a race on a mile and a half track in the Cup Series since Memorial Day. And it's now past Labor Day, so it's been a long time since we've seen these cars on this track type. And since that time, we've seen. Teams like Ford, or I guess manufacturers like Ford, make some pretty big gains. Now, a lot of it has been has gone to RFK Racing. Chris Bush are winning three of the past four races on ovals. And that could lead you to say, okay, maybe this is an RFK, stuff like that. I actually do think that the fact that we've seen these gains from Ford is somewhat encouraging for the other four teams that haven't surged just yet. And as a result, I actually show value in Ryan Blaney to win this Kansas race at 22 to one Blaney driving from team Penske and team Penske has had a pretty disappointing season, but Blaney did win Charlotte with the most recent race at a mile and a half track. And that was a long time ago, very different situation, different track than we have in Kansas for this week. But I think it was encouraging to see him not just 
win that race, but also win it in pretty dominant fashion with a third place average running position. Blaney hasn't had a lot of good finishes at Kansas recently, but he did in the past. Uh, he had a, a string where he was finishing the top five consistently, leading some laps as well. So I don't think it's a bad track, right? He's had some bad luck and bad situations here recently. My model is Blaney's win odds at 7.2%. His implied odds at uh, 22 to 1 are 4.4%. I show good enough value there, so I will take Blaney to win at 22 to 1. When I wrote up the betting guide over on uh, Fandle Research earlier on this week, I had three top 10 bets in that one. One of them has since moved. That was AJ Allmendinger. He shortened to plus 600. I do show, or plus 650, I should say. And I have value there a bit. Uh, I have Dinger at or 16%. His implied odds there are 13%. So a bit of value. But the better value to me is in the other two bets we talked about there. Those are Eric Jones plus 550. Austin Cindric has shortened as well to 8 to 1 but still showing value there personally. And Jones is another guy where it depends on how much stock you put in what we've seen recently. Because again, no mile and a half tracks, but we've seen some like higher speed non-drafting tracks. And like I'm putting Darlington in that bucket. It's high enough speed. Uh, I know it's a different track than, than Kansas, but some overlap at least. Michigan was in there, Pocono and Nashville. So those are the four races since Charlotte at Faster non-drafting tracks. And in those four races, Eric Jones has four consecutive top tens. So he's been much better than what he was earlier on this year. And in the Charlotte race, I think he actually showed speed there, but had a transmission issue pretty early. He retired early. Also had a pretty good run in Vegas earlier on this year. So although Legacy Motor Club has not had a good season, Jones has been good recently on tracks that require a decent amount of horsepower to be good. And I think that's encouraging for this week. Now, Jones, like Blaney, has a pretty bad recent track record at Kansas, where he's had a lot of poor finishes. No finishes better than 21st since he left Joe Gibbs Racing. But when he was with JGR in good equipment, he did run pretty well there. So I feel like, to me... I don't want to overrate the recent results for Jones at Kansas and say he can't run this track because I feel like you probably can. My model is Jones at 21.9% for a top 10. Implied odds of plus 550 are 15.4%. Cindric is 8 to 1. His implied odds are 11.1%. I've got him at 17.7%. Kind of the same thought process as with Blaney, where we've seen Ford overall getting better recently. Cindric actually does have good history at, at Kansas. He had a top 12 average running position here in both races last year. So showed some speed there and was good in Michigan too. Now, how much does that matter? Because it's like a drafting-ish track, uh, very high speed and stuff like that. I don't know. But I don't think it's a total non-factor. And if we still get Cinder here at 8-1 for a top 10. I think that's pretty enticing. So the three bets I like for NASCAR this week at Kansas are going to be Ryan Blaney at 22 to one, Eric Jones at plus 550, and then Austin Sindrick at 8 to one, potentially Dinger at uh, plus 650 if you want. But I think that one's uh, shortened enough where I'm not as interested anymore. That is all that we have here for today and this week on Covering the Spread. Got to give a massive, massive thank you to our two guests for today, JJ Zacharyson and Rob Freeman. You can find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB and find Rob on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck with your bets across week one, across this Friday for MLB, whether you're betting racing for this week, whatever it may be, good luck to you. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk to you once again on Monday. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 